حبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته everyone welcome again alhamdulillah it's an honor to be with all of you uh, we will jump right into it because i want to maximize our time uh, first we'll start with the dua uh, the dua uh, that a student of, of knowledge should recite uh, before um, their studies. So inshallah, we'll recite that together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughriqa wal-khatimi lima sabaqa nasir al-haqi bil-haqi al-hadi ila siratika al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqa qadrihi wa maqdarihi al-azim. اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم, سهل... اللهم لا سهل إلا ما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستقبلك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا آمين بسم الله So with that said um, let's go ahead and screen share إن شاء الله so that we're all uh, reading the document together الحمد لله So we are reading from the foundations of the spiritual path and again, as Sada Fadwa mentioned, the recordings for previous sessions are available, so you can go back and, and watch um, those to uh, kind of bring yourself up to speed. But we have only barely scratched the surface. It's such a rich document, mashallah. So we've only covered the first section here and the second section, and today we're going to continue. So again, just to remind everyone, the way the document is built is it gives us the foundations of the path first, and then the prerequisite uh, you know, things or qualities or actions that we would need in order to even get to the uh, the foundation. So it's kind of working us backwards in a way. So we talked last week about how, you know, one how if we wanted to, again, establish um, a strong foundation, we would need to have exalted aspirations, maintain Allah's reverence, expend ourselves in service, khidma, uh, fulfill our resolve. So once we, you know, have uh, have a, an intention that we actually see it through, and then to be in the practice of uh, gratitude, magnifying one's blessings, always mentioning them, of course, feeling the gratitude in the heart, mentioning it on one's tongue, and um, and then working towards good deeds as a reflection of one's gratitude. So those are the three levels of gratitude. Now, uh, today we're going to talk about how we can get to those uh, levels, right? Because those are that, those are all conduct related. So the foundations of the of right conduct, in order to get to to what we just shared, to to the place where we have exalted aspirations, where we can maintain Allah's reverence and we can do khidma freely from a pure intention, and we see through our our intentions, uh, making sure that we finish and complete them to the best of our ability, and that we're always in a state of gratitude. In order to get there. We have to then look at what uh, the foundations of the of right conduct or correct conduct are. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So again, he has these bulleted points here, um, organized, structured, so that we can really follow this through. The first point he makes is seeking sacred knowledge in order to fulfill Allah's commands. And this, of course, you know, follows logic, right? That in order to have correct conduct, you need to know what correct conduct is. So knowledge and being in pursuit of knowledge is really important. And we've, you know, I've mentioned this in, in previous sessions as well, that we as Muslims always have to see ourselves as students of knowledge. And it's really important that we don't, um, you know, that, that we uh, hold on to that part of our identity until we take our last breath, because Islam is so rich and it's, it's, it's so deep that we'll never be able to fully uh, arrive at, at any level of true, true understanding, but at least we can, uh, you know, we can be on that path, inshallah. So seeking sacred knowledge is first. And then, you know, um, just to share it, because it's a really good document, um, you know, uh, during the, uh, these, I, I've been giving uh, these sessions on the foundations for a couple of years now, and um, afterwards, uh, this is on a, an app called Clubhouse, you may not be familiar with it, or you may be familiar with it, but um, I asked Sheikh Hamza specifically, like, what would be a good text to follow up 
with this uh, text, um, as well as, you know, content of character and other texts. And he uh, pointed me to another text, which is really amazing. And that's what I'm working on now with some of the uh, students who attend the sessions on Clubhouse. And I'm going to share that with you right now. Let me find the link for it. Uh, but he pointed me to this document called The Six Points of Tabligh. And this was uh, this is actually a document put together by the, the group, as we may know it, uh, called tabligh i um, One of the main, I think the founder of it, I, I, uh, his name is actually here in the, in the document. I, ca I can't remember his name, but he, um, he put this together. Um, let me see if I can find it. So let me see here. Is it? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm looking for his name. Maulana Ilyas. Rahim, uh, so he he's the one who uh, put this document together. And then another brother by the name of Bilal Malik uh, translated it in English. So let me go ahead and share this in our chat here because it's a really great um, document for all of us to, uh, to benefit from as well, as it kind of gives you um, many of the topics that we're going to talk about here. It gives you more broader um, explanations and there's a lot of hadith and Quran, but that's the link for it. Um, oh, I think I sent it only to to the Sada Fadra. Let me send it to the whole chat. So you guys should be able to see this now. So this is a document that we're reading together, but there's a whole section there on just the 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 benefits, the merits, the objectives of of acquiring knowledge and and uh, being in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu. That's actually the third point of tabligh and it's really beautiful there's verses shared but also you know they mention here that the objective the purpose of the ilm is twofold the first is that one is able to differentiate between the halal and the haram and then as well as purity and impurity what's legitimate what's illegitimate and this would pertain to all aspects of life so that's the first purpose of why we should acquire knowledge the second is to know that at any given moment in one's 24 hour existence, uh, what Allah wants of him or her. And this is, uh, they have an Urdu reference here, uh, but it's uh, basically recognizing the command relating to the present. So, you know, this is really profound because as we know, part of the challenge of the modern world is mindfulness of is being present in, in the moment. Um, it's very easy to get caught up with the distractions um, that are all around us. And even in our own minds, even within our thoughts, we can be pulled away from the moment. So what knowledge does, as uh, beautifully elucidated here, is it first gives us all that clarity about right and wrong, basically, and good, pure, and impure, all of those things. But it also helps us to reorient ourselves in any given moment, because if you're uh, hyper aware of uh, the gift of life, of the gift of the present, and also you have that taqwa that uh, reminds you that Allah subhanahu is watching, that your deeds are being recorded, that choices are going to be presented to you at every given moment, and you have, you will be held accountable, then it brings you into that uh, that ideal state, right? That inshallah we all wish to be, which is again, present with Allah. So these are the objectives of, uh, and then they go on to, uh, in the in this document, as if you've opened it up, you'll, you will you can read, it's on page 11, you'll see the merits of it. And there's so many ahadith, mashallah, that you can just read through and skim through that really give us um, a lot of insight into the value of knowledge. This is again, not just, something that we should think of as the activity of a student um, per se, you know, like a, a registered student, someone who is, um, you know, pursuing that path of, of uh, scholarship um, as a student that would maybe go on to do more. That, if you, if you think of knowledge that way, then most of us would not feel inclined. But if you think of it, that knowledge is um, a pathway for us to gain closeness ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes something for all of us to partake in. So here, that's the first foundation. If you want right conduct, you have to seek sacred knowledge. And inshallah, we're all hopefully doing that in our lives. We're all here and we're all students of knowledge. So alhamdulillah. Uh, the second point um, is uh, that we you know, keep company with spir spiritual guides. 
um, and the fraternity of as sorry keeping a company with spiritual guides and the fraternity of aspirants to gain insight into one's fault false so this is also another really important point because if we try to go at this alone right this path of spirituality by ourselves very dangerous and as they say the one who doesn't have a spiritual guide a sheikh or someone to help them and then Iblis will be their sheikh, you know, or their guide, because he will delude you. He will, um, you know, make you focus on unimportant things and lose sight of really valuable things. So that's why it's very important to tether yourself to someone who is um, either, again, uh, ahead of you, you know, in terms of, of, of um, if, if you can have access, you know, not everybody does. If you have access to a teacher who's um, in part of the path, uh, you know, part of the uh, uh, the 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 chain of uh, of traditional sound knowledge he ha he or she has those credentials then that would be the ideal choice that you are in a solid path of of knowledge but if not then at least someone who is a little bit ahead of you right that maybe is older has been down the path knows what to stay away from because well as we get to in a moment there are pitfalls to each of these points which he's going to point out that if you don't have first of all, knowledge, or at least access to knowledge by way of a spiritual guide, then you are susceptible to falling and slipping and causing and having real spiritual struggles that may, um, may be very difficult to overcome. So keeping company with guides, but also a fraternity or sorority for the sisters, right? Um, but a group, a group that keeps you accountable, that also you can check in with. You know, it's so important. We're a dean of of Jama'a, we're a deen of Suhba, right? We're a deen of uh, the Prophet had companions uh, all around him, and they would, you know, uh, always be in his orbit because obviously they were they wanted to be around the best of creation. But I think that was a great, um, you know, model for all of us as well that have people around you, be in circles, you know, be with people who you can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. And as the hadith says, right, al mu'min al mir'atul mu'min, that the believer is a mirror for, for the believer. So if you don't have good company to help check in, right, to, to help if you stray, if you maybe you're, you stop, for example, um, let's say you're in a halaqa or you have a, a routine with a group every single week and all of you come together regularly, but then one stops coming, right? One of the, one of the uh, here, uh, attendees stops coming. Um, maybe they're, they've been, they've fallen into a bad group. You know, this happens all the time. Uh, people are consistent until something comes and distracts them, the dunya, shaitan, whatever it is, they're somehow now pulled away. Um, then your group that you've created or, or that you've been blessed with, hopefully, uh, realizes your absence and will check in on you. You know, will check in on you. They'll find out what's going on. And maybe, inshallah, there is, you know, a path uh, for you to come back. Um, earlier today, I was watching a video of uh, this young girl, you know, she's mashallah, very beautiful. And she was doing her makeup while she's talking, you know, these, now these are the trends where people um, have to be doing something while they're telling you a story, but she was going on about her experience with hijab and why she left hijab and um, that she's not religious anymore. She's all the she's not even fasting. Um, and I just, my heart say, just sunk, you know, because I'm watching her, listening to her very proudly talk about her experience in Islam as this forgotten past historical moment in her life that, you know, she's, she's not really lamenting about, she's not sad about, she's just kind of sharing certain things that happened to her. And I just thought, oh, like, I wish she had um, and maybe she did, maybe she had very good friends around her, um, but they, but she just, you know, Allah is the one who guides and misguides. But the point being is, you know, it's, it's sad to see that that it can happen to someone that they completely leave the practice of faith. But the beauty of having a good group around you is that they hold you accountable and that they follow up with you. They check in on you and they hopefully remind you of what's more important so that when you're distracted, by something that distances you from Allah, that you have this, this group that can hopefully bring you back in gently with love, of course. So that, um, you know, it's really important that we have uh, those, that, the, 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 those groups or those teachers, those guides to help us. And then the third uh, point that he mentioned, so it's knowledge and then it's 
people to hold you accountable. So knowledge is obviously the guidance that we need and we need to work on, you know, getting those from the proper sources. So it is very much intertwined, but also keeping in um, the company of really good people who will hold us accountable. So those are the first two points of right conduct. And then this is also really important for going dispensations and interpretations concerning injunctions for one's own protection. So I know it's very it's a it's a word salad as they say it's quite wordy this this one but it's um it's basically talking about not looking for the easy route right because part of spiritual mastery and discipline is welcoming some of the discomfort right I mean we're in it right now fasting is absolutely to help us build willpower and um, it is uncomfortable you know we're, we're not sleeping as much we're obviously not drinking and eating during the day but the discomfort that we experience has exponential benefits to it and so getting out of this very modern uh, mindset that everything good is always easy, right? Or everything good is always comfortable and um, easily accessible. That's actually not true as anybody who's ever worked hard at anything will tell you that uh, the more hard work you put into something, the more value it actually has. So sometimes what happens is, you know, we um, come into the practice of faith, but then we're looking for all those little loopholes or ways out of doing things. And we're kind of allowing that nefs to have, um, you know, some still some influence over us. Um, and, you know, this takes again for practice to, to become aware of even those little suggestions, those little nudges that maybe um, are always looking for ease, right? And so being disciplined enough to say, I need to, you know, take on this practice diligently, seriously, and not uh, give way for my nuts to, uh, to basically, you know, um, to try to in any way um, give me that ease so that I fall into those habits and then those, that becomes very difficult again to overcome. So that's also the third uh, point here on how to, to correct our conduct, our behavior, so that we can get to the prerequisites of what are then the prerequisites for the foundational path. So it's amazing, subhanAllah, that there's so much more to what uh, what uh, we would maybe assume to actually be on this path, um, it do doing it, you know, with the hasan, with with the correct way, um, and of course, Islam is easy. So I want to mention that it's not a difficult thing, but it's a matter of working smart, not hard. And working smart is having this understanding and this structure and this roadmap, and of course, looking at the Sunnah of the Prophet as he's our exemplar. That, that's how we work smart. When we work hard, we're trying to do it all on our own, which is the experience of many Muslims nowadays. You know, they just pick up books. They they, they flood their, their libraries with a lot of books. They'll take classes here and there. Um, they may open up the Quran or just hear kind of cherry pick different aspects of uh, Islam, which, it, which in and of itself is not a problem. But if it's not guided, if it's not done um, correctly, then it can pose problems. And I'll just mention this because it's relevant, but you know, recently during Ramadan, there's been a lot of online feuding, unfortunately. Um, and some of the most prominent Da'is uh, teachers, maybe in, you know, in, in the West, um, have been unfortunately caught up in a wave of, of argumentation, caused a lot of fitna because, um, you know, there's this new Scottish prime minister named Hamza Youssef. Um, this obviously is not Sheikh Hamza Youssef, although many people got it wrong. But um, this prime minister apparently took some positions on LGBTQ that are, you know, contradict Islam. And so some people, without really understanding the context with which he may have said things, we don't know. The thing is, we it's always better to be neutral on these matters because you don't want to be held accountable before Allah to make takfir on someone, right? Just because someone says something um, without a context, uh, you want to be careful. So anyway, this whole debate started and a lot of them began to argue. And um, for now a couple of weeks, ever since this was announced, I think there's just been these back and forth um, videos on YouTube and a lot of fitna, unfortunately, and it's, it's sad because this is the month of Ramadan, obviously. And so to see that so many people are getting caught up in all of this as a result of, of teachers, right? And may Allah forgive them and, and guide us all. 
But that's really heartbreaking because our teachers are supposed to be excellent examples for us. Um, and, you know, we're all human. And, you know, there was, uh, alhamdulillah, apologies given. And, and inshallah, things are, are fine between the hearts. But the damage that I think um, these types of things cause, we just don't know. Because many people, as soon as they see these kinds of behaviors, they just turn away. They turn away from the deen. So this is the value of having, you know, really not trying to just do things on your own, because then you may be blindsided by your own nafs and your own nafs is dictating to you and you don't know it. And next thing you know, you're embroiled in some fitna, whereas a teacher or a group or someone that really um, is close to you. And I think even in the way that the apologies have been given, it seems as though alhamdulillah, that is the case, you know, that, that somehow maybe teachers or, or a good company got to the individuals and they helped them to uh, to redress their their mistakes but this is again just the point of of the importance of value of having really good uh people in your life um so uh so we're on point number three so now the fourth uh, point here um is organizing one's time with the remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to maintain the presence of heart so this is also, you know, I think anybody who's, uh, you know, pursuing, um, uh, whether it's a, a personal, you know, goal or, or in this case, studies or work or, you know, they have some objective, they know that time is of the essence because time either works for you or against you. And the best way to make your time useful is to be structured, to be organized and to actually have you know, um, have your your calendar or whatever, you know, you use, you can use all these mo uh, modern gadgets. I know people who still use daily planners, <laughs> which seem like relics of the past in today's day and age, because they're not about like, you know, online stuff, it's all written, and they actually use the, the planners very effectively, because they can see it. And you know, they can, they take it with them wherever they go. So everybody is going to have to choose for themselves the best way but I think organizing your time to make sure that you know, um, you know what you're doing. As we talked about, one of the again objectives um, of knowledge is that at any given moment, you know what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants from you in that moment, and that's just such a beautiful concept. You know that that's uh, why I mean that's how we should that, that's how we should exist, right? That we're always aware of the present so that we can know what, what does Allah expect of me in this moment? Um, so scheduling yourself would obviously help you to do that because if you, um, you know, naturally, I mean, inshallah, you know, depending on our work and our schedules and our routines, um, we may have already figured out uh, a good portion of our ibadah in terms of our prayers, right? So those are usually kind of locked in because uh, the prayer times are known to us and inshallah we're doing all of our prayers, we're prioritizing them. But then there's also other matters that we should think about. For example, our relationship with the Book of Allah, which is why Ramadan is such a gift, because you know, it gives us the opportunity to really prioritize the Quran. And more so, I think, than any other time of the year, we become very consistent right, in our relationship with the Quran. And we will uh, pencil it in, as they say, um, as a priority in this month. So we, we're showing ourselves that it's very possible, right? Whether that's going to be after Fajr, which is, you know, um, according to the ayah in the Quran, right? That the recitation of the Quran at Fajr is witnessed, right? That this is the most recommended time to read Quran would be um, at Fajr time, uh, inshallah. So that could be part of your routine. And hopefully you're doing it. You know, you're doing it already right now that you can see that it is very uh, possible because Allah is showing you you're doing it so you know that you have that routine and then um, you know I I, I had a, uh, someone on Facebook the other day um, write a beautiful post about the merits and benefits of uh, doing 1000 salawat every single day and I believe um, our Mashaikh said that we should be doing at least 300 to 500 um, and that if a person doesn't have a spiritual guide, going back to the second point, that just doing salawat on a daily basis would compensate. And that's just beautiful, right? Because the Prophet is obviously all of our, uh, you know, our teacher, our murabbi, he, he is the ultimate uh, sheikh teacher that any one of us could want. So even by 
by just doing our salawat on the Prophet we are protecting our hearts. Um, but obviously, ideally, it would be nice to have a direct relationship with a teacher. That's just in the event that a person is so remotely uh, distant or not able to find one that they would at least have a recourse. So the, the salawat, though, as this post was saying, was the benefits of a thousand. And mashallah, the brother went on to give a structure that if you were to do you know, um, however many, 200, I think he was saying after every prayer, right, this is 200 times five, that you would gain a thousand salawat. And he's, you know, he just beautifully uh, gave the structure and the explanation that there's just, you know, the, the way you'll feel, the way your day will go, the way that you uh, will experience um, the openings that come from such a beautiful devotion are, uh, you know, are, are amazing. So that's how when we talk about organizing one's time, that's what it's about. It's about looking at what practices moving, I mean, for now, for example, we're talking about this in Ramadan, but what practices moving forward can we maintain and how are we going to plug them into our schedule? Because obviously we were only created to worship Allah. So that actually is the most important thing that we do but is that reflected in our day? And where is it reflected? Because just the prayers alone, which are uh, you know, un undisputable or undisputed, they're fardi, we have to do them. If we're distracted even during those prayers, um, because that's who, you know, our creation, we're, we're constantly distracted, then now it's it's a matter of quality, right? Not just quantity. So then where, where are we compensating, right? Where are we compensating? And to me, you know, when I think of the Prophet and his routine, the du'as that he left us, right? At every single point of the day, what I gained from that is that the prayers are spread out and they're, you know, really, uh, they're like massive kind of billboard signposts that tell us and remind us, right, that we, we have one purpose only, and that's alhamdulillah. But again, because we're so distractible, we need other little signs throughout the day as well. So it's not enough to just have these five big neon signs that remind you, you you're going to go back to God, you will be standing in front of him, and he will you know take you to task for all that you did. That is, is good. But because our nature is so distractible, uh, the Prophet has left us all of these, you know, uh, daily du'as woven within the day between the prayers, right? So you wake up in the morning, you haven't even, you know, prayed Fajr yet, but your tongue, you, you say the du'a for, for waking up. And then you move to the bathroom and you say the du'a for entering the bathroom. And then you come out and you say the du'a for leaving the bathroom. And you say the du'a for completing your wudu. And then you move forward and maybe you go and get dressed and, and you say that du'a. And then, you know, you go to pray. And so subhanAllah, it's so beautiful because it's like every movement almost that we do or every action that we do, even just, I mean, bismillah, that's, that's a, uh, what we should initiate all of our actions, but that being our tongue being moist with this type of remembrance throughout the day is constantly uh, reorienting us, right? So it's kind of like the nafs within is this force that it, that causes you to look away from your path. And shaitan obviously is calling you from the other side, you know, so you've got these forces that are taking your focus away from your path. And then you have uh, these other more, more better forces that are actually reorienting you when you look away. And that's how, alhamdulillah, you know, you, we can understand the du'as that we say and the prayers that we say. Um, and this is just human nature, right? So organizing one's time, really important. And to also be mindful. That's also the other part of it. So it's not just that we're reflexively or, or moving quickly mechanically through our acts of ibadah, but we're actually sitting paused, uh, you know, with real um, uh, presence, right? Doing that tadabur, tafakkur, um, just thinking about everything that we're experiencing, uh, whether it's you know, the breath that we're exchanging, you know, the, the, the carbon dioxide, the oxygen, just thinking about what a ni'mah it is to be able to breathe. Like, you know, I've seen, um, I've seen uh, people close to me who've been ill, have really labored breathing. And until you watch how stressful it is to see someone who can't breathe, 
you might not take it, I mean, you might take it for granted, um, but it's really something that if you're present with Allah, like even these things, these, um, you know, these systems, these bodily functions that we're doing at all times without any effort, right? They're, they're just happening because it's by Allah's will that you start to be like aware of it and like subhanallah you know when it was cold uh, the past couple of weeks for example i would look at my nail beds and you know if, if it gets really cold and your your extremities aren't blood supply isn't getting it you'll see you'll start to see this bluish purple hue on your nail bed you know that's indicating to you that your your blood is somehow you know not getting to to, to your limbs right and you know there's signs for that because when it's really cold, your blood uh, preserves your vital organs. So uh, that's why your limbs tend to be cold, right, as well, until you warm up. So your hands and your feet. But it's amazing that we have all of these signs that Allah has created to help us to just be mindful of these things. Like, you know, you're, you've got blood surging through your veins. And, uh, you know, there's all these, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's it's insane the length when you add up all of the, you know, the, um, the, the network of our circulatory system, right. For, with the blood vessels and the capillaries and the arteries, when you, when you stretch it all out, it's like thousands and thousands of miles. <laughs> it's hard to even fathom how that is contained within our bodies, but this is the type of thought process that brings one into the presence of, uh, of Allahu Akbar, right. Where, where you're just like in awe. And um, I would recommend this because I think he's doing an incredible job. There's a brother named Paul Williams, and he um, he's a convert to Islam from, from the UK. He has a YouTube page called Blogging Theology, which is very popular, mashallah, and he invites a lot of great guests. Um, but he also has, I don't know if he does it on any other platform. I just follow him on Twitter. He has a very strong Twitter uh, presence. But he has this amazing hashtag that he started, um, which is just so great. And a lot of the stuff he shares, I think, would be great to even show your children because he finds these incredible examples of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, you know, mulk, this is, you know, the universe, whether it's, you know, celestial or, or animal or just the, you know, the, the plants and vegetation. But what he does is he shows us, he reminds us. And the hashtag he's created is called no design. And he kind of does this thing where, you know, he writes no design and then there's like a little eye roll emoji and he's speaking to the atheists, right? Because the atheists are so quick to look at human um, accomplishments uh, and, and fawn over them because, oh, we're so intelligent, intelligent design. But then they, um, they, they don't have that same reaction to the natural world where there's phenomenon everywhere. So anyway, these are really wonderful ways that you can just get those kind of doses of wonder that we all are so in need of to bring us back into that state of, this is incredible. Like the fact that we are in existence this is incredible, like that we have consciousness, right? It is something to behold. Um, so those are the ways that we can do that. But if, again, we have to organize our time. And then under the last point he makes here is suspecting the selfish soul, the nafs, right? In everything in order to free oneself from its whimsical desires and to be safe from destructive circumstances. It's very hard to, um, you know, like when, when we think of harm or or evil or darkness, we usually think of external things, right? But sometimes we forget that the greatest harm to ourselves, to our souls, is actually within us. It is the nafs. It is the greatest impediment, the greatest evil, the greatest obstacle to our closest to Allah. So to suspect the self is very important to constantly question oneself that when you uh, do something you say something um you uh, you know you you take a position right sometimes we take hard line positions on something and we feel very right to always be a little suspicious of oneself what is my motivation why do i feel so strongly about this is this a, a thought that my nafs is compelling me to or is it truly something of virtue this is how we we do this process of suspecting the nafs. So um, alhamdulillah, these are the five, again, foundations of right conduct. And now if you just scroll down, 
um, as we're doing, you will see that he's going to go over the pitfall of each. And this is also really relevant information because he's reminding us that as we pursue these uh, ways of uh, conducting ourselves to be mindful of what could happen along the way. So the first is saying, the pitfall of seeking knowledge is the company of sophomoric people, whether due to their age and intellect or deficient religious practice. In other words, those who do not refer to sound principles of guidance in their actions. So a person, for example, could take on the path of knowledge, but then they fall into the wrong group that doesn't have good, um, you know, first of all, they don't have, uh, you know, a, a, a a tradition that, uh, or or a chain, excuse me, they're not part of, of a sound uh, chain of transmission. This should be the first red flag because anybody who claims to be a teacher, right, who claims to have knowledge should be able to provide their background. Like, who did you study with? What what are your credentials? And I think we understand that, interestingly enough, in, uh, in a material sense, right? Um, if you go to, if you wanted to, you know, take a, a class on mathematics or science or something else, you would want to know the credentials of the teacher and make sure they go to a reliable, or they went to a reliable institution and that they actually, you know, are credible people. So the same applies, if not more, to our faith. And that um, that requires transparency. It requires someone being very um, open about their teachers and what they studied and what credentials they have. And people who don't do that, but yet speak um, as though they are authorities are very dangerous, very dangerous. And there are many of them. There's so many of them now online with uh, TikTok because these spaces have exploded during the pandemic. Um, you know, TikTok, YouTube, there are a lot of da'is. They, they call, they self, you know, describe themselves as da'is. But uh, just by their takes, by the way that they speak, they don't lack, they lack adab, which is a hallmark quality of a believer, let alone a scholar or a teacher or a student of knowledge. So a person who espouses, you know, righteousness and deen and, and got, tries to direct people to the book of Allah and the sunnah, but does so with a foul tongue, does so while simultaneously cursing other people, that is not someone you ever want to take deen from. Um, and so be careful, basically, that when you're seeking knowledge, that you seek it from people who are actually credible and check their sources so that you don't fall into um, the dangerous groups that are uh, that abound right now. The pitfall of keeping company with the spiritual guides and the fraternity is elitism, deception, and self-righteous meddling in the affairs of others. This is a, an amazing point because this absolutely happens, right? Group think is real. When you start to follow a certain, um, you know, kind of belong to a group and you um, you carry yourself a certain way, maybe the, you, where you live, there's a certain group that is recognized by the community and it has, you know, some rank and status. And now you've, you're in that group. That can be very dangerous spiritually because now is it the uh, the the you know the glory of being a part of a group like that that you're seeking or is it the glory of God right What are you seeking What what are you Why are you there So the danger is that you might start to really again um, uh, like the enjoy the perks right Enjoy um, all of the uh, doors that are opened for you as you are now part of this elite group of students or, you know, uh, spiritual uh, seekers. So these are the things you want to be very careful of. And also that sometimes when people get very enmeshed with each other, they create unhealthy uh, co, uh, you know, dependencies where, where they lose the respectful boundaries that we should always maintain, you know, just because someone is in your home and you're interacting with them day in and day out and learning from them doesn't mean that now you should uh, pry or meddle into their uh, business or affairs. But these are where, you know, just having more uh, clear, de clearly defined boundaries would help, which can be a problem if people get fall into this group thinks uh, type of um, uh, issue. So there's just something to be mindful of, not to fall into group think. Um, and, uh, and, you know, keeping company with, with people who may, uh, you may feel that, that sense of pride in just belonging to, it, you have to be very careful with, with these things. So the third pitfall uh, that he mentions is of foregoing dispensations and interpretations concerning injunctions 
is self-pity due to hardship. So if there are ruchsas, for example, um, that you, uh, you know, would want to seek out that because you're disciplining yourself, you might start to, shaitan, you know, your nafs might start to make you feel like you are, um, you're a victim of some type, you know, like, oh, this is becoming so hard for you. And I'll just give you a very brief example. As we know, uh, uh, you know, for, for women who are pregnant or nursing, the option to fast is there. And every woman has to make a decision for herself, right? Every woman has to make a decision for herself. So, um, and, you know, many people would say it's up to, you know, the medical, um, like if she has, you know, a doctor or someone advising her, but also herself, like if she notices she's feeling weak, that she, you know, uh, can, can take that ruhsa. There are more, you know, conservative opinions that would say it's better for her to fast. And, you know, unless there is a direct threat to her or the baby. So there's difference of opinion on this matter, but someone may find themselves in this predicament where they want to be strong. You know, they want to be strong. They want to maybe push through a fast while pregnant or nursing, but then that, um, you know, because they're doing it for the sake of Allah and they're doing it to, um, you know, to maybe limit the amount of makeup fast they ha they'll have to do later. There, there's a lot of reasons why people would want to push through the fast, right? But then, this idea might come where it's like, oh, you, you poor thing, you know, you're suffering. And all of a sudden there's this guilt and this shame. And, and that's where you have to be very clear that when you make a decision, right, as we uh, mentioned before, that you see it through and you don't just um, start to self-pity because that is enough dictating to you. Um, and also don't rush into decisions, right? Make decisions thoughtfully, carefully, because you want to commit to them. And similarly with people who wear hijab, you know, there are a lot of uh, sisters who wear hijab because they have resolve, right? They feel it, they feel the himma, they start to do it. But then somewhere down the line, all of a sudden, you know, they... Um, they uh, they forget that there's you know if they if they take the more conservative route of wearing hijab, um, they'll start to feel like they're missing out because oh so and so is wearing like a wrap and she can kind of be more creative with her style and she wears makeup and so there's all this wasmusa that enters the mind and maybe that sister now starts to feel like somehow because she didn't take certain easy uh, you know paths that she was, she's being, you know, um, she's, she's on the short end of it. These are all short, you know, again, pitfalls that you want to be mindful of because enough lies, enough deceives, enough tricks. So um, that's an important point. And then the pitfall of constantly suspecting the selfish soul is inclining towards its upright states and goodliness but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us were he to offer every kind of compensation, it would not be accepted from him. So when we, um, you know, uh, start to suspect the nafs, that's also part of the trick of the nafs is we can start to feel proud of how well we are mindful of our nafs. And so, you know, these are all just very subtle spiritual things that can creep in and compromise the purity of what we're doing. And so he's pointing all these things out so that we can be very uh, you know, aware and awake and vigilant, right? And he goes on to say, moreover, the noble son of the noble one, Yusuf, the son of Yaqub, peace be upon him, um, uh, peace be upon them both, says in the Quran, I do not say the selfish soul is free from blame. The selfish soul indeed commands to evil acts, except for those on whom my Lord has mercy. So that's just an example. And some people attribute this verse to being Zulekha who was speaking. So there is a difference of opinion, but here we're just citing this opinion. So, you know, to, to be careful that if you get so far to the extreme of thinking like you've got your soul figured out that that might make you feel, um, uh, you know, puffed up a little bit. And that in and of itself is a sign of, of, of the delusions of the nafs. So there's all these things to be mindful of, uh, alhamdulillah. And I think we can stop um, so that we can allow for some Q&A before we stop. And then we'll continue next week, inshallah, with the foundations of what will cure the sicknesses of the soul. So this is going to be really uh, interesting as well, because we have to remember that we all are diseased. We have spiritual disease of, of different varying degrees, um, but we also have cures and remedies. So inshallah, we'll talk more about that uh, next week. But let's go ahead and um, I'll stop the screen share and Ustada uh, Fadu, if there are any questions from that I'm happy to, to take. Thank you, Ustada Hassai, for that beautiful class today, mashallah. 
I just want to um, ask that everybody put their questions in the Q&A versus using the chat to make it easier for us to follow, inshallah. So I'm, there's two questions in the Q&A right now. The first says, Salam, how can we become more intentional with seeking good virtual sahba if it is evident that seeking it in person is difficult where one resides? Mashallah, excellent. I mean, a beautiful question. Jazakallah khairan. I think you're at the right place. I mean, here we have Rahma Foundation, one of my favorite organizations, because the whole purpose of it is to bring sisters together, to learn from one another, to be in these companies. And if you've haven't yet been blessed to attend a, 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 an on-site um, uh, qiyam or halaqa, then alhamdulillah, they do have a lot of online uh, you know, programs. And they're, they're going to have one, I believe, Tuesday evening, and then continue through the odd nights, uh, qiyam, a major one on Friday evening. So I think you know, looking to contact um, people or, or organizations like Rahma and asking, maybe you could even say, I'm in this particular region or locality. Is there, do you, is there a way, is there a bulletin? Is there a way for us as Rahma students to engage with each other so that I could put out like a bulletin maybe to say, hey, I'm in this area. I would love to meet up with any sisters who are also in a similar area. Or is there anyone from the online virtual space that would like to have an offline um, group. And, you know, I, I'm, um, I follow, for example, this, someone had this great idea. So Sheikh Hamza through the Zaytuna College, he has the book club, right? The first command book club. And it's a, it's a great, uh, mashallah, space. If you're, if you're not familiar with it, look into it. But one of the attendees decided to go on Telegram and create a group for all of the book club members. So now everybody is talking to each other and then they have this amazing, I don't know how they did it because I'm not really familiar with Telegram, but within that group, they have a bunch of subgroups all based on top, it's topical. So they have topical subgroups like parenting. And I'm like, what a great idea. You've brought people from an international audience together on a platform. And now each person kind of has their own niche or, you know, group to, to be able to, to you know, uh, to uh, dialogue with. So there's these options, but I would definitely say contact, you know, the info at Rahma and see if there's a way for you, maybe during one of the PMs to put it, put that out there and, and we can put you in contact with some sisters, inshallah. May Allah bless you. Thank you. I actually didn't know that the book club had uh, a group. I need to get on that. <laughs> oh, you're going to love it. It's incredible. The subgroups I'm just shocked at. I'm like, how do they do this? We all should do it. Yeah, maybe, we, maybe you need an Ahma Foundation telegram page. Yeah, maybe that that might work we, uh, if somebody knows how. Maybe I should join that one to see how it's organized and then yes. kind of go from I, there. Halas. Yeah, I think we should. And I'll help you with that, Sadafado, because uh, I think it's a phenomenal idea. So may the sister who asked, may, may you receive the reward of that, inshallah, if it happens. Hopefully it'll happen. Connecting people, inshallah. And again, another question similarly related. What uh, what are the best means for cultivating good sahba in one's local community if there are no third spaces to gather meet people? How can one initiate in this area if there is a clear gap? Alhamdulillah. Great, great um, question. Jazakallah khairan. I had a sister a few years ago attend one of my halaqas and she had just come back from like an Alamiya program, but she was in the same boat. Like, what do I do? So I told her, I said, you know, this is how we started off. Asal Fadu knows, you know, 25 years ago or so I, I've aged myself, but yes, that long ago, we were doing halaqas out of home, rotating from home to home for the sisters who had space and just meeting weekly. It was called Friday night halaqa, um, but we were meeting weekly. So I just told her, you know, just start at the home level with a few sisters, sincere sisters, make it once a week, twice a week, whatever works for your schedules, but do it at someone's home. Don't worry about the space. I saw her maybe a month and a half ago at an event um, where she invited me as a speaker to her organization that she now works with. And she shared this with me. I forgot about that in her exchange, but she said, SubhanAllah, you told me to start home halaqas. We started with four or five people and now look. And I was shocked because I'm speaking at this incredible event with hundreds of sisters and it all came from that seed. So start with just a small group in your home halaqa and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of the rest. You'll see it expand. Maybe at some point someone will say, hey, we have a venue. Why don't you use it? And you'll it'll just turn into something amazing. But always have um, you know high hem inshallah. May Allah give you tawfiq. 
That's great. I mean, even the Rahma Foundation, it was just a group of us that came together that wanted to have programs, yeah. you know, some 15 years ago. And, you know, you just slowly build, inshallah, they get, uh, that we can have more of these types of uh, organizations across the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mashallah. Oh, I'm sorry. And I just wanted to make mention because sometimes when people think of starting a halaqa, they fear that they have to have like a lot of knowledge. But the best thing to do if, if you feel like you're with a group of people that are kind of all starting off is to look to the teachers. So there's a lot of resources already. So I know people who come together, they'll watch a YouTube uh, talk and then they'll talk. They'll read a book together and then they'll talk. This is how we grow in knowledge and also how we respect, you know, we kind of stay in our lane so that nobody starts to get ahead of themselves and you know presumes to uh, to be um, more you know on the uh, uh, more more um, qualified than maybe where they're at because it keeps you in line when you have uh, teachers to hold you accountable to. So that's just something I want to mention. But I'm sorry, go ahead, Osada. I think there are a couple more questions. Sorry, I had to mute myself. One of my children was like calling, and I'm like, shh. <laughs> oh well, it worked out. I didn't know. <laughs> just, actually, it worked out perfectly. You literally started and ended as I was dealing with that. So alhamdulillah. <laughs> Um, All right. The next question says, my question is, how can I strengthen my soul to not care about what others say about me? For example, I recently hosted an iftar for in-laws and someone commented on the dryness of a certain food. I felt I, I was very sad and felt defeated and had anxiety. I worked so hard to host and cook and felt disrespected. SubhanAllah. May Allah bless you, sister. The fact that you cooked in the month of Ramadan for guests supersedes any critique they could make of you. And the thing is, the best thing to do is when you see people lacking, uh, you know, the most basic of adab, like the Prophet said, when he didn't like something, he would never criticize it. He just would avoid it, but he wouldn't go out of his way to tell the person, this isn't good. So if you see people lacking this very basic etiquette of how to receive your hosts and, and feel grat grateful that they cared to invite you, that they cared to cook for you, even if it wasn't the most perfect meal, then you should just, you know, look at it like as a deficiency in them, make the offer them, but certainly not take their critique to heart because your reward is with Allah. Whether it was dry, that's a very subjective thing. Some people could eat, two people could eat the same thing. One person comes out and it's raving and the other person's like, no, it's not. So subjective criticism like that are not something you should ever, you know, let affect your heart because the Nia that you had in, in, in cooking for them and the beautiful, you know, uh, reward, the rewards that, that are awaiting you, as I said, far supersede one person's criticism. So don't uh, attribute uh, that as some flaw that you now have to worry about and, and you know, fear that, oh no, I, I'm a bad cook. No, astaghfirullah. They just lacked basic adab. And make dua for them and make, uh, and just be content that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. We don't need to be pleasing people because you'll never please people. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the bare minimum we do, the bare minimum we do, he is pleased with us because we still are, are, are showing up and we're fighting ourselves. It's not easy to fight uh, oneself, right? So alhamdulillah, sister, your reward is with Allah. This last question is my favorite. It says, Salams, my mom is wondering when you're going to release a CD an uh, anthology of your lessons. I suggest maybe <laughs> a commentary on the CD set of Purification of the Heart, along with your clubhouse sessions. <laughs> and some book writing on top of that, too. <laughs> Jazakallah khairan. That's very, very kind and generous of you, mashallah. Um, you know, I... As Ustada Fadwa knows, uh, this is I'm kind of in this perpetual um, struggle because I love to write, um, and then there's so much need in our community. There's a lot of you know needs that come my way, so I have a very difficult time managing what's what my heart tells me, what my mind tells me. Because if it, I had it like my way, uh, I would you know be more um, I would be more structured, be more be more consistent with producing and doing things. Cause you know, we all want to be able to um, have goals that are met, but I think my heart gets pulled in so many different directions. So it's really difficult. And I, I feel like a broken record. Just make the offer me please, because I think at a certain point, <laughs> like we all do, um, you know, we're going to run out of gas and uh, you know, we're just going to have to slow down. And maybe that's, that's when you might see more, um, more writing and more, more content being produced, um, hopefully, inshallah. <laughs> but, but thank you for the good opinion. May Allah bless you. 
I think we'll just have to make you solar so you don't run out of gas, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Uh, and then and I think that's it for questions tonight. And then um, inshallah, if you can just close with a dua, that would be great. Absolutely. Oh, again, first of all, Jazakum al to the Rahma Foundation, to Asada Fadwa and the whole team for helping put these wonderful programs together. I love this text and I'm so happy to be sharing it anytime I can. So thank you for the platform. And thank you to all of you for attending week after week. As we mentioned, we will likely have to go beyond Ramadan. So I hope you'll stick it out for as long as you can. Um, and inshallah, the recordings are available to you as well. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا everyone إن شاء الله we will see you next Monday Wow, this is, I think, the most punctual we've ever been. One minute past the hour. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, but we'll see you next Monday. Jazakallah khair wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.